what I believe is the third and final of the lectures on Freud's Totem and Taboo. Uh, a little bit of a warning, the last two uh, recordings were made, let's just say late at night when I was a little bit tired. And, um, you know, the content's okay, the presentation is a little bit off. I, I, so I'd like to give a quick summary of the first part of the book uh, at a time when I'm fresh enough to speak in complete sentences. So um, in the first chapter, uh, The Whore of Incest, Freud essentially outlines, uh, um, you know, the basic relationship between the two great concepts uh, from the book. And we're using, again, the Norton Standard Translation of Freud's uh, Totem and Taboo. So, uh, you know, a totem is a collective representation of a group. It's a sacred thing. It's set apart in Durkheim's terms, and it is honored and worshipped by the group. It really is a, um, a self-representation of a society. In the language of uh, my friend Mark Worrell, uh, when you look in a mirror, you see a self. When a society looks in a mirror, it sees a god. Uh, or if a tribal society or a clan-based society looks in a mirror, it sees a totem. So a totem is an animal that's taken to be the collective ancestor of the group, like a witchetty grub or a grass snake or a, a kangaroo or something like that in, in, in Australia. And the belief is that, that the people of the group and the totem share uh, some, you know, some common ancestor and that that uh, totem will protect, like provide a force shield around uh, the society so long as you do two things. Number one, you have to love and honor and worship uh, your totem. Uh, and number two, you have to obey the commandments of the totem. So the first one, uh, the first of the taboos. So, oh, by the way, what's a taboo? A taboo is um, a sacred law, the violation of which is considered to be a, uh, um, a fundamental impurity that has that endangers the entire society. The idea is that if, if someone in the group um, uh, violates a taboo, the entire society is essentially guilty. And that, you know, that rather than allow that person to, um, you know, to, to, to cope with the negative consequences themselves, they'll often uh, purge the group, uh, purify the group, remove the impurity uh, by, uh, by some process of expiation, making pure um, um, a piacular rite of some kind, right? So a taboo is a sacred law, the violation of which pollutes the entire society. And, and, and the totem will remove the uh, protection that it was providing for the group um, if someone in the group has violated the taboo without retribution. So the group has to, number one, not kill the totem and worship and honor the totem. And number two, don't enjoy the totem's women. The women of the totem are off, are no touch uh, for the men, and the men of the totem are no touch uh, for the women. So, you know, it's really interesting that the Judeo-Christian tradition, the, uh, the Old Testament, um, Ten Commandments are uh, incorporate both of these. Um, the first commandment is, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. That's essentially the same thing. Thou must worship and, 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 um, and honor um, me and not have any other totem. So don't kill the totem, you honor it. And number two, uh, don't enjoy the totem's women. There's actually two commandments that deal with that. Um, one of them bars adulterous relationships between men and women. And the second um, one, I think it's number nine or something, actually bars the mere thought of it, right? So there's actually two commandments dealing with that. So these two major commandments don't uh, kill the totem, honor and worship it, and don't enjoy the totem's women, a very widespread, right? And if you do that to protect a force field around the society on the part of its totemic uh, um, um, spirit um, force will remain uh, present. So Freud goes into a kind of a, a long discussion here where he makes the claim that the taboos of a society are only going to um, be effective if they're actually uh, barring uh, objects and behavior that is strongly desired. In fact, he claims it's going to be the strongest possible desires of a group of people are going to be precisely those things that are barred by taboo. And, uh, and so, he, so his claim is that a conscious taboo is going to mask an unconscious desire, and it's going to mask one that's really strong. So Freud's argument is, is that a society grabs hold of its members, transforms um, you know, biological homo sapiens into a member of a particular society by 
blocking access to the direct realization of desire or the direct satisfaction of drives. And instead, by blocking it, you transform that, that person into a member of a society that honors the commandment of don't touching and don't realizing your desire and, and honoring your totem. So the energy that would have been expended um, in the enjoyment of direct drives and a realization of desire, that energy then becomes available uh, for society. So he talks about mother-in-law avoidance rituals in this chapter. He's really talking about the barrier against enjoying the totem's women. So the mothers of the totem, the uh, sisters and brothers in the totem are barred from, um, you know, from intercourse with each other and, and incestuous relationships with each other. And these are totems, not biological mothers and fathers, but brothers and, and, and sisters and father and daughter in a totem. And so he claims that there's kind of an excess quality to this. And so he writes about mother-in-law avoidance rituals, which are widespread. Essentially, wherever you have an incest taboo, which is essentially everywhere, you also often have mother-in-law avoidance rituals. And so he highlights some of these, and he just makes the claim that this exists, right? This avoidance ritual, the taboo against you know, contact with the mother-in-law is actually covering something like a deep desire. So whether that can be argued or not, his bigger point is that um, wherever there are totems, there are taboos, and wherever there are taboos, the consciously articulated taboos are going to be masking unconscious desire, and in particular, the strongest desires in a society. So that's how a society generates energy. Uh, that's how human beings are transformed into beings of society is by blocking the direct access to desires and taking that energy and expending it in ritual behavior and other things. So in chapter two, uh, Freud is going to talk a little bit more about that energy and about the emotions involved in totem and taboo. And so his claim is, um, again, knowing what those two great commandments are, thou shalt honor and worship and love the totem and thou shalt reject and avoid the totem's women. Um, he's going to make the claim that that um, that because right because the um, because you have um, a unconscious desire a desire that society forces unconscious because you have a conscious prohibition against it that both positive and negative emotive states both valences of emotion love and hate are going to be present. In fact, he basically says any value in a society is going to simultaneously be hated and any enemy of a society or any barred, you know, taboo thing or object is simultaneously going to be desired and wanted. And so emotional ambivalence, right, bivalence to, to emotions um, is going to be prevalent and, you know, widespread in society. And that what the unconscious does, right, the line of consciousness, the unconscious, you repress desires inconsistent with the totem and taboo system into the unconscious where they get they don't go away but they wind up uh, getting inverted and displaced elsewhere so um, the way that this works right uh, I'll try to use this little image here so in one of these totemic groups um, you have a desire for we'll say um, um, yeah the taboo objects let's say for the women of the totem you're a witchetty grub totem member and you like one of uh, would like to have access to to some of the um, uh, you know uh, witchetty grub tribal members and uh, you're on your way to do that and you are barred from doing it uh, by the totem's commands so Freud says, well, you would obviously hate the thing telling you no, and you're going to, you can't, you want that thing, right? But you're being told, no, you can't have that thing. The witchetty grub uh, women, you have to, you have to give them up. So you have to develop a negative emotion state towards that, towards the thing you desired. So your desire goes unconscious and it's replaced with its inversion, hate. So the taboo, totem and taboo structure takes unconscious desire, represses it, flips it over and displaces it. So, so instead of having love for or desire for the women of the totem, you wind up with aversion for them or hatred for them. So you avoid them. And then the uh, totem, the thing that's saying no, which you have initially some sort of, of hate for, it's telling you no, you hate this, you rebel against it. But the totem taboo system says, no, you must not, you must love, you must not hate the totem. So you repress that negative emotion uh, goes underground, it gets displaced onto the totem, uh, you know, the tabooed objects, the tabooed witchetty grub women. So it gets displaced there, and then it gets inverted and reflected back onto the totem. So instead of 
hating the totem, you con- so you unconsciously hate the totem, but you consciously love the totem. You unconsciously desire the tabooed objects, but you consciously uh, avoid or hate those objects. So the totem and taboo system then essentially is a mechanism for repressing the realization of desire and the uh, satisfaction of primary drives. That energy that is conserved then is, is repressed and projected back out in an altered form. It is either displaced, so like the hate that you felt for the totem gets displaced onto the things that totem bars you from having, right? So you hated the totem for saying no, but you displace that, is projected out, right? The hate for the totem is projected outward into the world as despite, uh, you know, uh, you know, something like, um, uh, you know, negative feelings towards the thing that the tabooed object, right? Uh, and then on the other hand, the, the thing that you desired, the repressed desire gets uh, inverted and projected outward as love for the totem. Similar, and then there's this displacement that goes on. So the, uh, the hate that you initially feel for the totem, yeah, gets displaced onto the other. So it's displacement and inversion, displacement and inversion. So the emotional ambivalence of a society and the members of a society lead its members to um uh to invert so so there you go so um um yeah so so um you know i i in class i we won't go into a lot of detail here but in class we often talk about about the obsession with uh you know gay marriage uh or or gay relationships among a certain cultural conservatives religious conservatives political conservatives in america and so the idea that Freud says is that if someone is really, really uh, anxious about gay uh, relationships, gay marriage, gay desire, or if they're really animated about it, they have a lot of hate that they're expressing towards those who are practicing what they view to be a tabooed relation or a tabooed uh, behavior, that that hate is actually masking, that conscious hate is actually masking unconscious desire. Um, and then similarly, those who express really, really conscious love for, say, like an authority figure, a political th- figure, that that frequently is masking unconscious hate. So if someone, say, you know, decorates their boat or decorates their house or something with flags or, or symbols representing some political figure that they bizarrely admire and love for some reason, that that overconscious love is masking some kind of hate right so there's an inversion of of valence of emotional uh, quality and then a displacement that goes on as well okay i think we're ready then to move on to chapter three so in chapter three freud then is going to deal with um, animism magic and the omnipotence of thoughts he's really going to be dealing here with narcissism so um what he's going to tell us is is that um that the, he's going to be basically outlining the central logic of the social order based upon values and rituals. And he's going to say that, that in essence, um, the logic of society, society of values, is a logic of magic. And so he's going to talk about the two major forms of magic, imitative magic and associational magic. And he's going to be linking those to the, to the rituals that support the honoring of totems and the um, hatred and avoidance of taboos. Okay, so how do we go about maintaining a society of totem and taboo? His argument is going to be through ritual. What is the logic of ritual? The logic of ritual is going to be the same as the logic of, of narcissists who are, suffer from, you know, what, what psycho, uh, psycho, psychoanalysts sometimes call magical thinking disease. You imagine yourself to, um, to be omnipotent or have omnipotent thoughts and that you can directly affect change in the world, uh, not by working hard or doing something, but simply by thinking using your omnipotent um, grandiose self, something along those lines. And that that's essentially how tribal peoples uh, operated or how uh, traditional people, even in the modern world, operate, right? They imagine that they can affect outcomes in the world, not scientifically, but through magical thinking, what we would probably call prayer, okay? Okay, so um, so let's see if we can jump to that. Um, yeah. You know, maybe, bef- yeah, no, let's go. let's go ahead and do that, and then we'll come back. Okay. So he starts by talking about animism, okay? Animism. 
So uh, animism is a um, it's a it's a you know 19th century uh, a term developed by ethnologists and anthropologists that um, um, that uh, sorry uh, that um, that recognized that in many uh, sort of tribal or, or, or uh, primitive peoples that the material world is doubled in a spiritual world, okay? So you have a material world of objects that is doubled with spirits, right? So spirits aren't just something that are um, uh, qualities of, of the um, world of humans, but that animals have spirits, uh, rocks have spirits, uh, wind has, you know, features of nature has spirits. In other words, the entire material world has a double, right? So society is doubled in a totem, right? So society is the material reality. Uh, you know, the actual members of society interact in ritual and their collective representation, their spiritual representation is a totem. An individual member of a totemic society, its individual uh, um, uh, spirit double is a soul. Um, and then, again, in the material world, again, spiritual things are the double. He writes about magic and sorcery uh, being uh, fields of human endeavor or thought that bridge the gap between the material and the spiritual world. That's what a sorcerer does, right? Or a magician. They intercede in the spiritual world to achieve material effects, or they intercede with material objects in order to achieve spiritual effects. Okay? So that's magic and sorcery. And so his argument is, is that, again, in, in, in the material world of a tribal society, that there's going to be an organization of political, economic, and social life, right? That people are going to organize in some way. And that that organization is going to be doubled spiritually with rituals uh, to honor totems and punish violations of, uh, of taboos. So there's somehow or other, while the society is in the process of honoring its, tab its totems and avoiding its taboos, it's going to actually be accomplishing the uh, economic, political, and social ends of society. Okay, So a society will think it's engaging in ritual for the protection and honoring of, uh, of totems and you know, honoring of taboos, and it, what it's actually doing is this. So the material world of society, its economic, political, and social life is going to be doubled in the spiritual life. Okay? All right. So, um, all right. So, uh, here we go. So, yeah. Let's set, let's come back to this too. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, skipping around here a little bit. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, let's just head right here. We'll just use this. Okay. All right, so what this means then is that, yeah, the material world is doubled um, and that sorcerers uh, treat the spiritual world as though it were animated by beings that essentially have personality. So a sorcerer deals with demons as people, that the world of magic is essentially a world of demonic beings that can be, you know, again, appeased and treated like a person. Generally, a sorcerer sort of commands the spirits in the same way that a king would command uh, his subjects, that kind of thing. A magician deals more impersonally with forces, right? So he writes about mana, uh, and mana is sort of a tribal way of referencing, um, and yeah, so, so, um, um, yeah, so, so the magician then is going to try to control the material world by manipulating the spirit world. Um, so the material world is, is subject to cause and effect relationships of a scientific kind. The spirit world is going to be, we're going to talk about this, is sort of going to be governed by the laws of similarity and contagion. And so the magician is going to try to material impact the material world of cause and effect by operating in the spiritual world using a logic of similarity and contagion. So so basically we have here a kind of omnipotence of thoughts. I'm going to cause crops to grow, not by applying fertilizer, but I'm going to uh, get crops to grow by prayer, or I'm going to get crops to grow by spraying holy water on a field, or as he writes about, I'm going to cause crops to grow by, uh, you know, by a farmer and the farmer's wife going out and mating in the field, where the 
fertility of the reproductive act of the, of the mating couple is somehow or other similar to uh, the reproduction of the crops in the field and that by a kind of contagion, the couple engaged in this reproductive act will then lead the uh, crops in the field to grow more powerfully and more robustly, something like that. Okay, so um, so that's it. Yeah, so the crop fertility by sex in the field, as he's talking about. Okay, all right. So the rules of magic then are the rules of ritual. They're the rules of, of animistic coping with the material world. So first is the rules of similarity or imitation, where you are essentially engaged in the, um, um, again, you're kind of trying to mimic the action you're trying to see in the world. So if you're trying to get crops to grow, be fertile, you're going to uh, engage in some act of fertility um, on your own with the hope that that catches on. If your goal is to kill um, a king, you will burn an image of the king, right? And that by burning that image, that's a magic act of similarity that will hopefully kill the king. Or you'll, um, you'll have a little taboo, um, a voodoo doll or something like that, that you'll stick pins into causing the uh, real person represented by the doll to die, right? That's uh, the magic of, of similarity, of imitative acts. The second kind of magic act of social ritual to influence the magical world is that of contagion or contiguity, he says, or association. So here, again, it's not that you're imitating the act, but you are uh, touching upon the act, uh, upon the, the effect. You're doing something that touches upon the effect that you want to see realized in the world. And by doing that, you're going to spur it on and, 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 and again, kind of make it happen. So, you know, some of the rain dances that are performed among among tribal peoples. It's, it's the idea of, you know, the sound of the rain, the sound of the, um, of the drums, uh, you know, the motion of the dances and so on. It's not really an imitation of, of, of the rain itself, but it's somehow or other though is associated with some of those features of rain and that that will then lead it uh, um, to occur. Okay, in both cases, uh, again, this is the rules of magic as well as the rules of social ritual in a totem and taboo society. It, again, the two big laws, similarity and contagion. So you engage in rituals that uh, to feed the totem, and so you literally will take food and burn the food up, right? Imagining that the totem has eaten it. Or if you're going to uh, uh, purify the society, you will literally burn a witch, right? In order to make sure that the totem is satisfied and that the impurity has been removed, something like that. So it, it, it's the you know, omnipotence of thoughts, a kind of narcissistic orientation to the world where you project emotional impulses into the world as a symptom, right? That's his argument, like you're projecting it in and then you're coping with it as though, uh, again, you can deal with it magically. So magical thinking and superstition, uh, it's really a disavowal of the basic rules of, of, of morality. Well, let's take a jump here really fast and let's look at, at um, one of the types of ritual that are often uh, dealt with in, um, actually, let's not use this image. Let's not even use this one yet. Let's use these. <laughs> uh, if I can find my drawing. I've misplaced a drawing, which is driving me nuts. I just had it here a moment ago. Yeah, here we go. This is it. Okay. So, yeah, this is the one with the biological birth. Okay. So, um, in Freud's writing and Lacan's writing and Levi Strauss's writing, structural uh, uh, sociology, basically, right? The biological birth of the human individual occurs at birth. The psychological birth of the human individual occurs through the mothering process. It doesn't have to be a mother. It can be men. But you have a, a series of caretakers who mirror back to the growing self, a psyche, a soul. You get ensouled by a mother, basically, or a set of motherers who, who mirror into you a kind of a virtual self, right? The, the mirror of uh, surface of the mother's face, the mother's responses gives you a sense of self, right? So the psychological birth of the human individual occurs somewhere like between the ages of say two and five through the uh, mothering process. There's an earlier phase of that as well. But you really, by the age five, it's done, right? That's you, you have a first name, you have a kind of a sense that you've been ensouled by a mother or by a caregiver. But the sociological birth of the human individual occurs a little later. And that uh, occurs through rites of passage or rites of initiation. Um, in a totemic society, um, the child, the infant, is ripped away from the mother-er that initially ensouled it, 
ripped away. So here's the mother or probably has another little child to take care of. So the human individual right here who now has a psychologically born individual is now going to be sociologically born. So they're grabbed literally by the members of the totem who then engage in, in ritual acts of, of initiation, right? Rites of passage. And so, uh, so you, the, the, uh, the child imagines itself to be uh, captured by the imaginary totem, but they're, they're actually, again, being in the real, captured by the real totem of the actual social member. So it's rites of passage, rites of, of initiation. Um, again, you get a totem name. You usually get renamed in some way. Um, you get a new identity. Um, uh, you often actually get a cut, a, what I'm going to call a kind of social orifice, uh, a cut, a wound um, um, that allows for the entry of the social spirit, the totemic spirit, into the individual. Often there's painting and scarification and tattooing goes on. There's, there's teeth knocked out and that kind of thing. And the effort is to sort of remake the body, remake the individual into uh, a member of the totem. So you stop being mother's child and you become the totem's a member, right? The child of the totem, the totem's member. So cutting, scarring, uh, circumcision, dubbing, you know, hitting on the head, that kind of thing is all part of it. Um, so the logic of society, the logic of the ritual order um, is manifest in the rites of passage uh, and rituals of initiation. So those laws of magic that Freud just wrote about, the laws of, of association, similarity, um, that those two laws uh, are present in, in ritual of initiation. Um, yeah. So guilt. So Freud writes, right, that guilt and repressed drives and desire then are the energy source of the ritual order. The greater the repression, the greater the sublimated energy for society uh, and the greater the power of the ritual order. OK, so that sort of lies underneath this. So in animism, omnipotence of thoughts, this chapter, the logic of omnipotent thoughts and magic is shown uh, here in rituals of initiation. That's what we're going to do. So imitation and similarity, you get the cut, you get the spiritual initiation and contagion and association. You get ideas related to uh, an act uh, that causes an act of prayer um, that, um, um, hang on a second. Give me just a moment here. There. Okay. I, I just sent that out. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah. So, um, ideas related to an act cause it to happen, right? So, prayer can cause, by speaking the words that of the thing you want to see happen, that can be associated then, that can, you, the words are contagious, the omnipotence of thoughts spoken in the word, right? That by symbolizing something with words, um, you can actually cause it to have an effect in the real world, right? Okay, so, um, okay, um, and, um, Yeah. So in so symbolically, then by getting a new totem name, you become a member of the totem. Right. It's that symbolic thing or by getting a symbolic writing on. Right. You symbolically get written on. Right. That gives you a new identity or something. Right. Um, and then, yeah, like he writes about like the symbolic avoidance of particular names can actually cause, um, you know, that person to uh, avoid prevents that person from being uh, sort of um, conjured up. So the ultimate act of, of initiation is circumcision or subincision, as we saw last time, where literally the, the member, the boy being initiated into the totem gets a cut. And the cut literally makes the child capable of reproducing totem members. And, and, and as Spencer and Gillen write about this, if they actually believe apparently, that, that a biological infant can be born to someone who didn't go through the sub-incision ritual, but that the sub-incision ritual is necessary for there to be spiritual effectiveness and for totems uh, to be born um, of, the, um, of, of, say, of, of that child, something along those lines. So here's um, another image of it, right? The cut, um, yeah, the overwriting um, 
of the uh, tot totemic order. So here's a scarification or a, a tooth knock. I think it's actually tooth being knocked out here, uh, being shown as a way to initiate someone into the logic of the totem or the rules of the totem. Um, I've got another image here. Um, this is of Rangvi Aranta, where uh, after someone dies, often there's a cut made, and the cut is a um, is a mechanism for the symbolic or spiritual um, honoring of the person so that you're never quite the same and that the spirit of that person can enter back into the group or be let out of the group. In other words, it provides an orifice for the exchange of, of spirit. Um, yeah, so this idea that you get a cut at the moment of initiation, where you essentially get a socially generated orifice into the body through which spirit can be transmitted. This is a very, very uh, common thing. Again, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, this is essentially, uh, you know, what circumcision is uh, at core, right? Okay, so, so those acts, those acts of initiation, um, operate with the same logic as magic. It's either contagion, new symbolic name or something like that, that then causes the effect to be a member of the totem to be realized, or, you know, you're actually like, um, um, you know, again, like, like imitating the behavior of a bird, dressing like a bird if that's your totem member, and so on, and then, and then engaging in those acts. So, you know, in, in many of our initiation ceremonies, there's almost always a renaming process. Um, I was c Catholic uh, as a boy, and I went through a confirmation process where I was renamed uh, Joseph. Uh, St. Joseph became uh, my name, that kind of thing, right? So you get a new name uh, when, you, um, when you go through an initiation ritual. Women, for example, often get new names uh, when they go through a marriage uh, a ritual of some kind, right? At least that used to be the old um, uh, mechanism, right? Okay, so let's summarize then. So in Totem and Taboo, uh, so I'm going to use the same four fundamental concepts that Lacan argues are at, at, at play in Freud. So Freud's psychoanalytic writings, these are the four concepts, the unconscious, repetition, transference, and, and drive. And we're going to see that Freud's arguments about society um, implicate those same four concepts. So in the unconscious, society is a group of people structured by their repression of drives and desires into a social unconscious. So there's usually love for the totem authority um, and what you're actually pushing into the unconscious. You're leaving behind love for authority, but you're pushing into the unconscious rebellion, hate, and fear. The tabooed objects that the totem tells you you can't have are consciously desired, and that desire then gets pushed into the unconscious, leaving behind something like negative affect or hate, right? So you consciously love the totem and hate the tabooed objects while secretly or unconsciously hating the totem and loving the tabooed objects, right? So you get that inversion and displacement. All right, so these, uh, the unconscious, the totem and taboo structures always, always, um, uh, yeah, located at the strongest uh, uh, desire. So what you're blocking is the strongest desire and drive and that's what generates the maximum amount of energy. If the totem and taboo structure was just on irrelevant parts of human life, it wouldn't generate much energy. But because core fundamental uh, drives and dry and desires are, are, are disrupted, it generates massive energy that then can be used for social life. So repression is, um, is, the, is excessive um, and metastasizes, right? So not only the specific uh, object that's barred um, or the specific act that's banned, is eliminated into the unconscious, but all traces of it as well, all right? So when he writes about the mother-in-law avoidance rituals, you don't just repress the mother, you repress the desire for all things associated with mother, including mother-in-laws. So there's that excessive quality to it, right? So you, so in other words, repression itself has to be repressed. Then uh, knowledge, the idea of repression has to be repressed. Okay, two, repetition. The things that are repressed return, right? So the repressed desires and drives don't just go away, uh, but they reappear. And, and, you know, they're constantly putting pressure and then they reappear and seek an outlet. And it is really the structure totem and taboo that determines where the outlets are and the kind of projection, the kind of leakage out into uh, consciousness uh, that, that occurs, right? So, um, yeah, so it shines into consciousness in disguised form, often with um, the valence inverted, right? So you get love gets inverted into hate, hate into love. So, um, yeah, so that's there. And then you get this transference or displacement that takes place. So when the repressed returns, the object is often displaced. 
So uh, an object of love, you love, you re you repress that love, but the love comes back out, but it's replaced onto a different object, right? Desires and desires and, and drives are displaced to socially sanctioned objects and actions. So that's one of the way that the taboo, totem and taboo structure shapes social action is by determining not just what is barred, but then determining the direction uh, through which desire is allowed to flow, right? So the unconscious shines into the desire of society, include that which is which is socially sanctioned. Okay, and then drives, the sublimation of drives, right, uh, is what makes culture. So culture is essentially sublimated drives, repressed drives. Uh, and so society is composed of, ontologically composed, it's what it's made of, right, of displaced and inverted uh, repressed drives, right? So it's that old, um, you know, sublimation theory of society that you find in like Herbert Marcuse and other sort of uh, mid-20th century writers, right? That, that sublimation is the key to society um, and that people work uh, uh, because they can't, they're blocked from loving, so that's what makes them work, that kind of thing, right? So that culture itself, it becomes an expression. You know, unrequited love is very productive of poetry, right? If, if your lover accepts you, you don't write poetry to that person. It's only when the person, um, you know, doesn't return your love that then the pain of that is something that generates great poetry, great love songs, uh, those kinds of things, right? Okay. Um, okay, so, so then to just sort of summarize, uh, this is basically the way that the totem taboo structure operates. This is the subject, this is the tabooed object, and this is the totem. Okay, so the totem has two basic rules. Don't touch the tabooed object, and then you must love and obey me, right? Okay, so the, the love that one would normally have for the tabooed object, it starts out as love, but it gets blocked. Thou shalt not, no touch. That love then is unconscious. So that's what the dotted line represents. The love for that object gets, get, or the desire for that object gets goes unconscious, and the love reflects back, reflects back and winds up being displaced onto the totem, right? So there's a, a substitution of the, of the totem for the formerly desired tabooed object, okay? Hate, now, you're going to hate the totem because it just told you no, and you can't realize your desires. You're going to hate it, but you're not allowed to because it says you must love and honor me. So that gets bounced back. The hate for the totem goes unconscious, and then you consciously get, a, um, again, a inversion and displacement. So instead of loving the object, or excuse me, instead of hating the totem, it gets inverted. Let's follow that line here. So instead of hating, yeah, hate gets rejected back and then gets gets sent back as right there as hatred of the tabooed object. Okay? So you get inversion of val valence and a displacement of, of object. Okay? So those are the two things. So without totem and taboo, in a world without totem and taboo, the world of desire and drive, you just meet them, right? Desires get uh, realized, uh, drives get met directly, and they're not really mediated very much by the symbolic structure, right? Uh, so you love love objects of real desire, and you hate objects that deprive and frustrate you, right? So this is almost like a pre-social world in which the energy um, is expended outside of the symbolic order. Your energy is simply being expended in living, and it's not being held back and then displaced onto the development of a cultural system. So with totem and taboo, the symbolic order displaces objects and inverts the polarity of feeling. So you uh, hated objects uh, wind up, um, um, yeah, you hate uh, objects that are hated and loathed um, uh, gets redirected onto something else and objects that are really loved gets redirected. So you get that inversion of, of object, yeah, the inversion of valence and, the, and displacement of object. And what you generate then by that, totem and taboo, that whole system of block desire and its displacement and symbolic representation and symbolic substitution, that whole system of ritual, uh, uh, like we were showing in the, in the rituals of initiation, that entire thing is essentially society. That's what society is. So society is built out of these rituals to honor totems and to honor the b barrier to taboo and to punish the deviants and so on, and that that is essentially uh, what society is, okay? So here's another depiction of it that I thought maybe worked a little bit better. I'm trying to figure out how to, how to depict this, but um, okay, so this is sort of, this is so, so in, in, in society then, this is the totem. Uh, you have the conscious love for the totem. Here's the barred object. You have a conscious hate and fear of that tabooed object. So on the surface, when you look at a society, you see people who love the totem and hate tabooed objects. Love totems, hate tabooed objects, right? Um, but 
Um, if you could see underneath society, this is what Freud is telling us, if you could see underneath the surface, the unconscious uh, flow of energy is very different from the conscious representation. So the totem says, give me love, right? Honor my name, um, and says, no touching uh, the objects that I tell you not to touch. So that's what appears to be happening on the surface. But again, unconsciously, you actually had desire for the, the tabooed object that remains unconscious. And then it gets, again, displaced onto the, um, right? That gets displaced onto, right here, onto the love for the totem. So you have love for the object. It gets barred by the totem. It, it's taboo, and it winds up going up. And so you get the love displaced that would have been for the object it's displaced onto the totem. And then the hate that you would direct at the totem winds up refracting off, ricocheting, and winds up back as conscious hatred for the object of desire. Okay? So again, displacement of object and inversion of affect or the valence of affect. All right? Pause, love for hate and so on. Okay. All right, so, so, what are, so what is totem and taboo? What is he telling us about then? He's basically arguing that the human subject in society has drives and unconscious desires. We don't see those. What we actually see is a kind of an order that looks to be governed by reason and rationality and consciously known rules and so on, right? However, that the symbolic system then, society, the system of totems, taboos, of language and law, structures the unconscious and determines the aim and the direction of the um, of the repressed uh, desire, right? The um, and and the unconscious then show shines into consciousness through the totem and taboo structure, right? So the when you look out into the world, you not only see perception, as Freud says, but you actually see memory of repressed desires. The unconscious, right, leaks in and shines onto uh, the world of perception. So the world that we experience, the meaningful world that we experience, the thing we take as real, reality, isn't something that is just, you know, sort of measurable by science, but it includes the distortions of, of repressed drives and desires, right? Okay. Okay. So uh, let's go on to the last chapter then, chapter four. Chapter four is the big payoff. It's the longest chapter by far. And he calls it the return of totemism and totemism and childhood processes. So let's let's look at this first. Where, where he begins this chapter is with phobias. Phobias. Now it's really interesting. In Freud's work, a phobia is an irrational fear of a thing, but it's not a psychosis, right? So he has this really strange argument that only neurotic people, people who are structured with neuro, neuro, who are neurotically structured, who have a big daddy, who have a symbolic order installed within them, so that bars psychotics, have phobias. So people who have phobias, it's like having a very, very extremely one-sided uh, irrational belief. Unlike a person who's psychotic, who can have sort of free-flowing beliefs going in all directions, none of which are sort of anchored in reality, okay? So, um, so in a phobia, right? You, what he argues is he uses the case of little Hans and a little Arpad. These are two uh, patients. They're grown, I think, by the time that he's analyzing little Hans. But Arpad is actually a child. In each case, the father was represented as a very frightening and fearful person, right? And I believe, certainly in Arpad's case, and maybe even in little Hans' case, I think it was true, that there was like a nurse or something or a nursemaid who said, wait till Big Daddy gets home. Big Daddy is going to punish you. And the way that Big Daddy is going to punish you is literally to castrate you, which apparently was a fairly common threat among babysitters back in the day. Um, just think about that for a moment. Anyway, well, the point is, is that many of Freud's patients who were fearful of castration apparently actually had experienced threats of castration, over, outwardly spoken, avowed threats of castration when they were kids. So it's sort of funny that, that, that the thing that Freud writes about actually was present in the real. So you have these two little kids, two little boys, both of whom are fearful of Big Daddy who's going to castrate them, right? And in each case, they develop a phobia for an animal. So little Hans develops a phobia for horses and keeps getting afraid that a horse is going to bite off his vivi mocker, his wee-wee maker, the thing for, with which he makes wee-wee, um, his genitals, basically. And little Arpod uh, has the exact same thing, that, that he's afraid that the chicken, the cock, is going to snip off his, um, his um, 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 yeah, uh, sexual organs. And so, and so in both cases, um, the big daddy... Uh, who's giving these orders about don't touching, don't touch, don't touch, that sort of thing, right? Don't touch yourself here. 
um, winds up being um, imagined to be a threatening uh, personage who's going to threaten castration. And in both cases, the little boys wind up developing a strong fear of an animal. So they maintain love for Big Daddy. They openly love their fathers and don't fear them, while the fear and hatred for the father gets displaced onto the horse, in Hans's case, and onto little Arpod in this case. And as Freud writes about in that chapter, little Arpod doesn't just fear the chicken, he actually develops a cult of chicken. Like he, he develops his own little totemic world where he sort of reenacts being a chicken. He gets all excited about chicken blood and watching chickens get killed and that kind of thing. Um, right? So so phobias, this is what's crucial to this to this article, is that phobias are displaced fear of authority. Right? So you have an authority that, that commands you to love and honor and worship it and then gives you commands that you find frustrating and fearful. And so you're not allowed to hate. Consciously, you cannot hate the totem or the, the big daddy or the authority figure. And so that gets displaced. The hate that you would feel gets displaced onto something else. Now, I want to really emphasize this. This, this winds up reappearing in, in only slightly altered form in um, the 1930s and 1940s and 1950s in the writings of, of critical social theorists who are analyzing fascism, where the fear of authority, the fear of capitalism, the fear right that, 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 uh, um, that was felt, say, in German, Germanic society, that that fear, you couldn't express the fear, and so instead you directed the fear and hatred onto some other object instead of a horse or a chicken, onto uh, the Jewish people, who then were literally scapegoats, right? Where you're projecting uh, sins and fear and, and, and threats and so on onto, onto people. So, so the structure that Freud is outlining here, an authority figure that commands your love and will punish you if you don't love it, right? Um, um, it means that the fear and loathing that you feel for that thing has to go elsewhere. So it gets displaced. So you wind up again hating the father, but you invert the emotion and consciously love the father instead. And that unconscious hate becomes conscious hate of a displaced object. Okay. All right. So what Freud is going to argue, which you know, I wind up spilling ink all over uh, this, we're just going to, have to let that go. Um, <laughs> um, so what Freud argues then in the book is the following. He claims that, that totems, that underneath totems, the structure of totem and taboo, is the same sort of fears that were um, experienced by little Hans and little Arpad. That there is a fear of authority, a fear of authority that then gets displaced into fear of some other thing that then becomes honored and worshipped as a substitute for the real thing that you fear, right? So the totem ancestor, the totem isn't alive, really. It isn't a real thing, right? There isn't like witchetty grubs that are right there in front of you going to punish you directly. Instead, you're a member of a society who collectively honors that totem, that totem of the witchetty grub, right? And that, so you hate and honor the witchetty grub, right? That instead of the father. Okay. So there's a displacement going on here, and we're going to see a bit of an inversion as well. Okay. So here's Freud's argument. He's going to go to Darwin and use Darwin's notion of the primal horde, right? So this is a kind of pre-social structure composed of very unstable groupings of, of subordinate men and, and women and children. So you have a bunch of women and children and subordinate men underneath the direct physical domination of a primal father, an alpha male or primal father of enjoyment. We'll add Zizek's term on here, okay? So the father has the monopoly of the enjoyment of the women, right? The women can only mate with the father and reproduce young through the father, right? The primal father. So again, the women aren't actually daughters here. The women are, um, um, you know, um, um, uh, mating partners of, of the father. I guess they, I guess I really can't say they're not they're not daughters. We're talking about Darwin's primal horde. So at any rate. Um, so you have the subordinate men. So they are kept in line. They have to subordinate, honor, and worship the primal father, who then gives them a command, no, these are mine, and you are mine. You shall worship and honor me, and you shall avoid my women, right? But this is a real live father. This is a real living person with muscles, right? And apparently tough. 
And we know what happens with the musculature of aging men, right? Eventually, the moment comes when one of the subordinate men um, can take them, right? And can beat them or kill them. And at that moment, then that person emerges as the new primal father of enjoyment, holds some of the women, some leave, and so on. Maybe there's going to be a split of the, of the group and so on. But so this is an unstable structure, and it lives and dies literally by the life and death of the primal father, the alpha male that holds it together. So we don't really have a fixed system of language and law. We don't really have a totem and taboo. We have an actually existing man who's dominating an actually existing set of women and children, and there really isn't a God here. We just have a guy, right? Him, the big dude, the one we're afraid of. Okay, so if one of the boys tries to kill him and gets caught, that boy will be killed because they will have violated the command, the taboo, thou shalt not kill. So the only way Freud writes that the primal father could be killed is through the, and, 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 and actually lead to something like social evolution is having the band of brothers group together and have all of them, I'm going to sort of draw in a few, a little arm and a few daggers here, like, like uh, imagine Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, right, where the senators come in and jointly stick the knives in Brutus, right, at to um, primal father. Anyway, something like that. So, so the subordinate men get together and ritually execute, right? They ritually, ritually execute the father. They do it collectively. And Freud is going to tell us that this death, the sacrifice of the primal father, happens. Uh, Robertson Smith, the great uh, author of the religions of the Semites, right? This amazing book about ancient magic and religion, um, argued that, that uh, in, we'll just say this, in Spencer and Gillen's writings about um, the totemic peoples of Australia, there's an annual ritual uh, in which the totem animal is ritually killed by the members of the totem. And during that festival, the women of the totem, who are normally off limits to the men of the totem, are um, available for, uh, for, for sexual um, congress, right? So there's some sort of sexualized exchange. I think Freud uses the term orgy, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, that uh, intra-totemic uh, sexual congress occurs during these rituals. So the two great taboos of the totem, thou shalt honor and not kill the totem or eat it, and number two, thou shalt avoid the totem's women, get violated during these annual rituals. He claims, Robertson Smith, that this is a real event that was uh, reenacted, and actually that's what Freud said. Freud claims that Robertson Smith sees the sacrifice of the god, the sacrifice of the totem, and the e ritual eating of the totem, and then the ritual reenactment of the killing and eating of the totem is something that underlies Christianity. That something like, uh, you know, the Christian mass um, is, is um, a kind of reenactment of, of a ritual killing of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a totemic figure, eating, right? Um, this is my body, right? And um, yeah, so... so Freud argues, here's what happens. So the primal father, the real father of flesh and bone, is collectively and ritually killed by the sons. The sons don't simply replace the primal father with one of them who's big and tough. Instead, the sons um, agree to create a society instead. What they're going to do is they're, create, they're going to create a society in memoriam of the dead father. So society begins through the worship of the dead father. So the dead father's in the grave, and they dance on that grave, and there's the gravestone, and the sons that just did the killing um, now honor, they feel guilty about killing the father, and that guilt leads to all of this energy that is then used to avenge the father's death after he's dead by agreeing to honor the commands of the father. So instead of thou shalt honor and worship the actual living father. They're now going to honor and worship the memory of the father or the name of the father. And then they're going to um, continue to keep the women that used to belong to the primal father uh, sacred. So they're going to continue the incest taboo, right? So the totem then, honor and worship, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so you get then the creation of the spiritual double. So the spiritual double of the society. So here we don't really have a society. We have a group of guys who are being dominated by an old man. The old man's dead, buried. The name of the old man becomes the uh, the, the totem. 
And now we have a group of people who actually form a society. So what is this society? The society is now the group of people who ritually honor the name of the Father. The spirit double of the society becomes the name of the Father and who ritually protect and honor and, and uh, avoid uh, uh, sexual congress with the women of the totem. So you continue the prohibitions. So here we have a phobia. So you are afraid of the primal father and you're afraid that the primal father is going to avenge death. You feel guilt and you're afraid they're going to avenge him. And you just, you avoid that by displacing, right, the uh, father onto, right, onto a collective representation, a collective representation in the form of a totem. So maybe you're going to have, again, a witch, this is a witchetty grub. So you're going to have a witchetty grub totem in the name of the father. And, um, and by honoring and worshiping that, you're displacing the fear, you're displacing the honor, you're displacing things onto that, right? So what is society? Society occurs only with the death of the primal father and the substitution of the real father of enjoyment for the spiritual or social or sublime father of, of, of law, language and law. So the first word, the first language word is the name of the father, deferred sacred word, the word set apart, the word that structures all the other words, the names of the group, and that kind of thing. And and then the law of no. The first no is the first law. And then, and so there you go. So you get language and law that are created by it. So what is society? Society is a kind of memorial group, a group that gets together for the honoring and worshiping of the name of a dead father and obeying the rules and laws of that father. Okay? So I think we've got it, right? And that becomes the bond. So what Freud tells us then here is that underneath society are drives, drives that are blocked. And the blocking of those drives creates energy. It's originally sort of organic energy, but now it takes on sublime form. So you get a group of people who are no longer merely subject to the commands and dominating power of an actually existing person and who instead become dominated by a symbol, an image, an idea. That idea takes the form of a totem. So in reality, the society is simply a group of people engaging in rituals. And somehow or other, by doing those rituals, right, by performing the rituals, somehow or other, the society nevertheless actually reproduces itself, right? By engaging in the ritual order, they're actually engaging in politics, economics, and social life family life even, and so on, right? So religion and society are doubles of each other. So here we are, the birth of the gods, the birth of sin, the birth of society, the birth of language, the birth of law, all through uh, a ritual murder. So this is it, sort of of like like, like behind or underneath or in the prehistory of every society would be this murder. Whether it actually happened or not, again, Freud calls it a just-so story. He realizes it's a myth. He realizes this isn't something that you're going to be able to, 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 to uncover with, uh, you know, with archaeology or something. But, but, but the logic seems consistent, right? So the ritual order of magic, of sympathetic magic, of imitative magic, right, of associational magic, that magic ritual order honors the spiritual double of a group of people, and by honoring that idea, that totemic double of the society, you're actually creating society itself. So what is society then? It's a group of people whose interactions with the spiritual world structure their actual behavior in the real, and they become reproducing uh, not just their own bodies and their own food sources and so on, but they reproduce the values the totems and taboos of the society um, over time, okay? So what Freud has done in less than 180 pages, I guess it's about 202 pages here, um, Freud has essentially given us a coherent, if unverified and probably unverifiable account of the origins of society itself. A pretty big accomplishment. Okay, and with that, I'll let you go.